Hello all, welcome to the lecture. In the last few lectures, we were discussing about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy or NMR spectroscopy. In other words, we discussed about nuclear spin. So, from today's lecture, we would focus on a different spin, which is the electron spin. So, we would focus on electron spin. That means, we would start discussing electron spin resonance spectroscopy or as I have already mentioned before, it is also known as ESR spectroscopy. So, this ESR is shown by the species which has one or more number of unpaired electrons. So, this is the primary condition for ESR spectroscopy. So, this is the primary condition. So, the primary condition for ESR spectroscopy is the presence of this unpaired electrons and this unpaired electrons can be found for example, in let us say hydrogen atom in oxygen, in oxygen we have actually two unpaired electrons. In other molecules like NO, NO2, etcetera, it can also be found in radicals. So, in free radicals. So, for example, I have a let us say methyl radical which is represented by C H C dot or radicals like carbenes. In carbenes, we have again two unpaired electrons and third it is found in the transition metal ions. So, if you are dealing with transition metal ions, ESR spectroscopy can come handy and this transition metal ions has 1 to 5 unpaired electrons. So, we know that many reactions in organic chemistry. So, this organic reactions. So, many reactions in organic chemistry takes place via this free radical mechanism. So, what are these kind of reactions? One common example is that of the polymerization reaction. So, it is well known that the polymerization reaction happens to the free radical mechanism, but let us say we do not know whether really the polymerization reaction goes to the free radical mechanism. So, whether the reaction proceeds via free radical mechanism can be found out or can be ascertained by doing this ESR studies. So, one can get qualitative information that means, qualitatively we can say whether this radical is present or not from studying the ESR signal. And not only we can get qualitative information, but 
if we monitor the concentration of the free radical species and we can monitor this you actually in a quantitative way. So, if we can quantitatively monitor the concentration of the free radical species, we can also get some quantitative information about the free radical mechanism. So, let us look into the case of one unpaired electron. So, we are talking about one unpaired electron. So, this one unpaired electron can have two spin states. So, one is the alpha that means the up spin and this is the case, but the spin quantum number s equals half and m s equals plus half and the other state is beta which is the down spin. So, here s equals half and m s equals minus half. So, these are the two spin states. So, now let us look into the energy of the spin states in the presence of an external magnetic field that is p. So, this E alpha or the energy of this alpha state is given by minus half G s beta b and this is positive as this beta is negative. So, here the G s as we had already discussed is the G factor and the beta is the Bohr magneton and b is the external magnetic field. So, similar to E alpha we can write E beta equals plus half G s beta b and this is negative as this beta is negative. So, now because we have the energies of these two states we can actually look into the difference in energy that is delta E. So, delta E is given by E alpha minus E beta and which is G s beta b. So, this energy difference is large when we compare this with the energy difference we got in NMR and the resonance frequency as we know is given by nu that is nu is G s beta b by h. So, this is the frequency of the Larmor precision of the spin vector. So, this nu is the Larmor frequency. So, this frequency if we actually put the values will come in the microwave region. So, now let us try to draw like the transition here. In other words, when there is no magnetic field that is B equals 0, this alpha or the up spin state and the beta or the down spin state are degenerate because I have this vertical axis as the energy axis. However, in the presence of an externally applied magnetic field that is B not equal 0, these two splits and the lower energy is that of the beta state and the upper energy is that of the alpha state. So, this is down spin and this is up spin. So, in the presence of an externally applied magnetic field, 
the degeneracy is lifted and we have two states alpha and beta. And now, if a light in the microwave frequency falls on the system, so we can write this as new microwave, it will lead to a transition from the beta state to the alpha state. So, in this case we can see there is only one transition and because there is only one transition, we have one spectral line in ESR spectrum. So, now let us look into some of the important parameters So, these important parameters are related to the ESR spectrum. So, let us look into these parameters one by one. So, the first parameter that we will discuss is intensity. So, in an ESR spectrum, this intensity is proportional to the concentration of the free radical. So, we can write is proportional to the concentration of the free radical or we can write is proportional to the concentration of the para magnetic species because we are talking about species with unpaired electrons. And when we are talking about concentration, immediately the question that comes to our mind is what is the sensitivity of this ESR spectroscopy. In other words, what kind of concentration can it actually measure? So, the sensitivity is our second point sensitivity. So, this can detect up to 10 to the power minus 13 moles of free radical. So, this ESR spectroscopy is sensitive enough to detect up to 10 to the power minus 13. So, now let us look into the third parameter because we know for every spectrum there is an associated width, which we normally talk about in terms of full width that half maximum. So, the width of the peak in ESR spectrum depends on the relaxation time of the spin states. This is exactly what we saw in case of NMR also, but for most of the sample a typical relaxation time. So, which is denoted let us say by tau in ESR is of the order of 10 to the power minus 7 seconds. In other words, we can write this as 100 nanoseconds and because we have a time and because of this uncertainty there is a spectral width and the width is given by 1 by 2 pi tau and that if we put now. So, this is 10 to the power 7 divided by 2 pi. So, it comes around 10 to the power 6 hertz or we can write around 1 megahertz. Now, if you remember when we were talking about NMR spectra, the delta nu in NMR was in the order of 0 0.1 hertz. However, in case of ESR, this is 1 megahertz or 10 to the power 6 hertz. So, thus one thing that is extremely clear 
from this calculation is that the ESR gives very broad spectrum. So, now we can ask the question what are the consequences of this broad spectrum? First of all, there is an advantage and also there is a disadvantage. So, let us first look into the advantage. So, the advantage of this broad spectrum is the homogeneity of the magnetic field is less critical. On the other hand, the disadvantage is because the peaks are broad, it is extremely difficult to detect the peak position or we can say in other words, the detection of the location of the peak becomes uncertain. And because the detection of peak location is uncertain, what is generally done or practiced is the ESR plots are derivative plots. So, what do you mean by derivative plots? Let us say we have a spectrum which is very broad. So, it is very difficult because this is broad to find the exact peak position, but all we can see here that this is my y axis, this is my x axis. So, if you think about the slope or d y d x, this part has a positive slope, this part has a negative slope and this part has 0 slope. So, now instead of y against x, if I plot d y d x against x, what I get? I get a graph like this. So, this is where the value of d y d x is 0 and this point gives me the peak position. In other words, if the spectrum is broad and it is very difficult to find the actual peak position, we can resort to the derivative plots. It can be the first derivative, it can be the second derivative, which will give us the exact location of the peak. In ESR, normally the first derivative plots are being used. And now, we we'll look into another parameter that is the position of the ESR line. So, we know that the frequency is given by G s beta b divided by h. So, if we look carefully, we can see this beta by h, this is a universal constant. this frequency, this can be found from experiment and this magnetic field can also be found from experiment or we know what kind of magnetic field is being applied. So, in other words, we can write G s is nu h by beta p and we can see that G s can be experimentally determined or we can say it can be experimentally estimated. So, for a free electron the value of G is 2.002 and we have stated this in the initial lecture on resonance spectroscopy. So, let us say this is the value we get from theoretical calculations. So, from experiments, so from experiments the value of g that we obtain is 
2.002 plus minus 0 0.003. So, this is the error bar, but the error bar is pretty small. So, we can see the same value is obtained both from theory and experiment and in when we were doing the theoretical calculation, we only considered the electron spin that is the spin angular momentum. In other words, we do not consider spin orbit coupling, which means we do not consider any coupling between the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum. And even if we do not consider this coupling, we get to the value of g that is the experimental value and the error bar is very, very small. So, in theory no spin orbit coupling is needed to be considered to arrive at the experimental value of g. What does this mean for a free electron? It means that the electron is either in a state where the orbital angular momentum which is given by L. So, either L is 0 or the electron moves in the entire molecule freely that is the electron is not localized on a particular atom. However, now if you look into the transition metal ions, the value of g that is obtained is of the range of 0 0.2 to 8. But in this case, if we just consider the spin angular momentum, our theoretical calculations do not deliver the experimentally obtained value. So, in this case we need to consider the spin orbit coupling to arrive at the experimental value. So, what does this mean? This means the electron here is localized to a particular atom and because it is localized to a particular atom, the spin angular momentum vector which is given by S couples with the orbital angular momentum vector that is L to give a total angular momentum vector which is given by j. In other words, now the g is not simply coming from the spin angular momentum, but because of the spin orbit coupling we can write g equals 1 plus, then we will write j times j plus 1 minus l times l plus 1 plus s times s plus 1 divided by 2 times j times j plus 1. So, this is the expression if we put then we will get to the experimental value of g and this g is known as the lambda g factor. So, we will end this lecture here. We have given a brief introduction to ESR spectroscopy. We have seen that ESR spectroscopy happens when we have unpaired electrons. We have seen which are the cases where we have these unpaired electrons. Then we looked into the two spin states, the frequency that is the Larmor frequency, that is the frequency needed for the transition, and finally we saw that g or the g factor can be experimentally determined and from the theoretical and the experimental values we can find whether the spin orbit coupling is necessary or not. So, in the next lecture we will continue with ESR spectroscopy and we will talk about the hyperfine structure in the ESR spectrum. These are like the fine structures we saw in a high resolution NMR spectrum. <laughs>